and hello from the campus of Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We welcome you to Intersect, the DOD Academia and Industry Meet. My name is Shane McGraw, Outreach Team Lead here at the SEI, and today I am joined by Matt Bakovic, the Technical Director of our Cyber Risk and Resilience Team within our CERT Division. Welcome, Matt. Thanks, Shane. Great to be here. So this is usually your show. You're, you're always <laughs> kind enough to, to host these, but today you're the featured guest or the, the star of the show, so almost a promotion for you. I, I believe so. <laughs> and, and star is a stretch. Thank you so much for inviting me for this conversation. Yes. So to, to level set, can you talk a little bit about your maybe your background, what brought you to the SEI? Uh, we mentioned you're the, the technical director sure. for the Cyber Risk and Resilience Group. Yeah, thanks, Shane. Uh, so I, I've been with the SEI for about 12 years. Uh, prior to that, I worked in industry. Um, I worked in manufacturing before that banking, a uh, variety of roles uh, in IT, IT security, IT audit, um, strong interest in, in security uh, emerged uh, my sort of the later in my banking career and then took that to industry. Um, joined the SEI because I was looking for something different in kind of two ways. Uh, I was looking for a place that gave me sort of more intellectual freedom to explore the things I found most interesting, so kind of scratching that, that itch. And then um, being part of a mission that was important to the nation. So uh, certainly industry is a great place to be. Um, but I felt like I wanted to give back uh, in a different capacity. So here at the SEI, what we do um, is designed to enhance our security as a nation, uh, make our, our DOD stronger, make our civilian agencies more adept. And all those things appealed to me. So the idea that I could be at this nexus or intersect as right. you say, Absolutely. of academia, industry, um, and, and, and the DOD, it was really appealing to me. So you, I, you talk about mission a lot within your group. So w what's the mission of the CRR director? Can you give us a little, you know, a, a synopsis of why you guys exist and what you're, who you work with and what you do? Sure, Shane, no, no problem. So we're one of six directorates in, in the CERT division, and it's kind of in the name, Cyber Risk and Resilience. So the directorate, we do many things, but kind of painting in, in broad strokes. There are three teams, and we'll be speaking later about a, a specific role that's, that's available. So we have a team that focuses on cyber risk, so risk management. How do you identify sources of risk? How do you do the risk calculus to know that you're, you're investing enough and not too much? And uh, what do you do with residual risk? So there's a team focused on risk management kind of proper. Another team um, that's focused on resilience, so evaluating the cyber resilience of organizations. What does that mean? That means looking at the key capabilities an organization needs to possess to ensure that they can avoid as best possible and survive uh, a disruptive cyber attack. We have a third team, it's a little more special. I'm sorry, we're going to ask you. No, I, I was just, I mean, I know you talk about like it, it's just such a broad scope yeah. of things to, to do. It can almost seem overwhelming at times. And like the measurement of something like that is your yeah. team, how do, you, I mean, how do you measure that? Or how sure. Do you, yeah. So, um, we, we use a, a number of methods to do that. In some cases, it's doing technical assessments, so penetration testing, yeah. red teaming. And other times, it's looking at key capabilities. So here at the SEI, uh, we have a long history of, of capability maturity and measuring yeah. the key attributes of a process. Yeah. In the software development space, we know that the best indicator of future performance in software development is to look at the processes to produce that software. The same thing applies in cyber. So we look at those key processes, practices, because that gives us an indication of how we perform in the future. So um, our, our measurement is grounded in that tradition here at the SEI with some extensions and modifications specific to cyber. I should also say that one of the things the director does is um, address the problem of the insider threat or insider right. risk. So when, when a trusted entity that goes bad or does something even unintentionally. So those are kind of broad strokes of what we do. You asked about our partners. Uh, we work with the DOD in a, a couple of forms, so I'll highlight just a few. Yeah. Um, so working with Space Systems Command, uh, working with D Defense Cyber Crime Center. Uh, we work with the Homeland Security in a couple of different capacities, Department of Energy, uh, Treasury Department, and then a myriad of other, other partners. So we, we have a, a wide approach to the problem switch. I should also say that we, we also work with industry. So one of the things I'm proud of is that we've worked with um, select industry partners. Um, right now, we're working with Highmark uh, here in Pittsburgh, a healthcare provider. Um, we've worked with and continue to partner with the Bank for International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks, so uh, located in Switzerland. So um, I'd like to think that our approach is broad-based, um, and also we have 
we have reach uh, beyond ourselves. So speaking of industry, I recently read, I think it was on LinkedIn somewhere, um, supply chain attacks are up 430%. Yeah. So I know that's something I've seen you do talks and webcasts yeah. before in the past. Can you expl explain to us what a, what a supply chain attack is and why that number would be what it is now in your opinion? Yeah, that's a great question, Shane. So um, SolarWinds, I think, was a, was a wake-up call to many people yeah. where you had this very sophisticated attack on the software supply chain result in a vulnerability being asserted and then organizations being exploited by an adversary. Um, I like we should really think um, comprehensively about the supply chain. It's just not the software you buy, the hardware you buy. Increasingly, it's also the services you use. So yeah. think about cloud services, cloud storage, um, third-party software development. So I'm very interested in this question of external dependencies and supply chain is at the heart of that. So um, if you want to exploit an adversary, as, as adversaries did the solar winds. Yeah. Inserting something that's difficult to locate early in the life cycle in something that's pervasive is a really good way to uh, to affect your adversary. So why is it up 400% or 430%? Yeah. Because it works, right? Yeah. So, and it's complicated. Yeah. Um, think about all the pieces parts that make up that laptop, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, um, which is off camera. It, I, it, yeah. <laughs> believe, but there's a laptop. Yeah. yeah. Um, most organizations, yeah won't have the ability to really decompose that laptop and tell you what it's what, what it's comprised of, nor should they. But you're, you're making implicit trust decisions about that laptop, right, as, as a basic supply chain example. So how do organizations have justified confidence in their partners? How do they measure the performance? And how do they know when they need to invoke some procedure that compensates for some breach of trust? Yeah. Right? SolarWinds is a good example. And I've heard you use the term in past events, the, the silver thread of cyber. Is that yeah. tied into this? I mean, all these dependencies, cybers and everything? Absolutely. That... Yeah, and, and credit to Brett Tucker for, for okay. that, for that so. phrase. So um, the silver thread of cyber, the idea is that, that everything we do uh, requires information systems and largely now networks and the internet. Yeah. So there's very few businesses, maybe Amish pie making, I don't know, <laughs> right? I'm sure they have point of sale now, right? But right. very few things uh, are done in society without cyber. Right. So if you want to, again, disrupt, um, degrade, somehow affect an adversary, well, cyber's a great way to do that. It's also asymmetric, right? It's, it's far cheaper and easier to attack than defend in most cases. Right. So to combat this, I know your group has come up with a nom number of security postures to prevent some of this. Can you talk about some of the solutions sure. your group has, has done? Yeah, we, we have a variety of methodologies yeah. and standards and guidance, right? Everything from the insider threat guide to the cert resilience management model to the octave forte risk management model. Yeah. These are all tools. And by the way, for the audience, they're freely available on our website. So one of the things I really like about working for FFC is that Absolutely. We, we transition these things readily yeah. to those who need them at no cost. Um, so a variety of approaches. Now, on the technical side, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, uh, to underemphasize that contribution. So, our, our applied network defense team is doing great work in automating penetration testing, uh, building findings repositories, so that um, you can spend more time um, testing and less time sort of analyzing, automating the parts that are the easiest to automate. So you can spend the bulk of your time giving substantive suggestions to the the entity that you're testing. Uh, another work you guys done recently, World Economic Forum, yeah. uh, big deal. You yeah. know, talk a little bit about that, how that came about. Sure. A little bit. Uh, you know, what what was the the uh, the end goal, and you know, did you meet your, your meet your goal? Yeah, I, I had the privilege yeah. of being the curator for the cybersecurity transformation map for the World Economic Forum, um, and this is a, a, a an honor for CMU as well. Absolutely. Right? So I felt very fortunate to be chosen to do this. Well, what does that mean, right? So right. The, the transformation map is a set of the, the fundamental challenges in a given domain. So the World Economic Forum isn't just about cyber, it's about lots of things, right? So Absolutely. everything from water usage, cyber, um, carbon emissions, monetary policy, right? All the things that make a society work. Yeah. This is where that silver thread of cyber comes in again. What I found as we, as we built the transformation map was that it had these tendrils, it had these linkages to things like supply chain risk management, to quantum computing, to, to big data. So I, I think I feel satisfied that Carnegie Mellon did a very good job of, of providing the input to curate that map. Um, and I feel like we, we left something of substance there. 
Um, so our time is, is nearly up uh, in curating the map, and they'll, it'll go to another organization soon. And that's terrific. And I know uh, you did a past podcast on that, so mm -hmm. I know that's on our website. Was there a blog post as well? Uh, yes. So, yeah, if you're more interested in that, in that work, uh, check the SAI website. You'll see uh, pod podcasts and blogs. You can find Matt's team's work in that area. And, and also, Shane, sorry, I should say yeah. the World Economic Forum itself, right? You can Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so the reason we're here today, your, your team's hiring. You have a cybersecurity assurance technical manager. Yes. Is that the accurate we, description? Yes, we are hiring. So we're looking to bring uh, another technical manager um, into the organization. Uh, what does a technical manager do? Yeah, Might be a question my question. first question. Not yeah. to anticipate the question. <laughs> I would divide the, the responsibilities of the tech manager into three, three basic categories. There's managing the people. Right. So that is ensuring that um, we are getting the best out of our people and giving them the sort of experience that, that, uh, that they deserve. Right. Um, so there's, there's people management. The next column would be... Uh, partner interactions, collaboration, so working with the, the list of external partners right. I, I mentioned and, and internal partners. And the third column is managing strategic direction of the bodies of work. So in this case, for this specific role, the cyber assurance technical manager, um, it's that body of work that I, that I described or alluded to, which is looking at the cyber resilience or the cyber posture of organizations. Um, it's, it's a large team. Um, with, uh, with, with long partnerships with a number of these entities. Um, this is actually the team that I managed when I, at, at the SCI oh, okay. uh, prior to being a, a technical director. So I, I, it's, I know it well. Um, I would encourage anyone that's interested in the audience to, to have a look at the job description that's on our website. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a war on for talent. Absolutely. And I think I could explain why an FFRDC uh, offers unique benefits and unique experiences over other roles that I had in industry. Again, not to disparage those. Yeah. But we really are looking, and we're looking right now. Yeah. So, so please do um, have a look at the posting. Yeah, go to our website. You'll see a tab for careers, and then you'll see a link for workday and job openings, and all the descriptions are, are there. Uh, is this position located in Pittsburgh? Is that a requirement? Is it Arlington an option, or what's the expectation? Sure. So, it, yeah, it's um, it's, it's the, the position is listed as a Pittsburgh or Arlington, Virginia Okay. Uh, work location, uh, but there's some flexibility, right? We, as 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 you know, Shane, uh, through the end of the calendar year, the university is in this this posture where we're allowing folks to work fully remotely, um, and remains to be seen sort of what emerges. But that's certainly a hybrid uh, situation regarding office and home will will will, will emerge. Right. Um, so you have a rather large team. What other openings? Maybe a little less senior positions that may be sure. out there. Pen testers. That, what's what's what else? Yeah, that's a that's a great point, yeah. Shane. We're not just looking for the technical manager. Yeah. Um, we're also looking for uh, folks that can assist with risk management. So the cyber risk management team is looking for risk engineers, uh, and then we're also looking for more technical resources for the external threat and vulnerability management team. Where we're looking for um, for senior pen testers. Great. Um, you touched on this earlier, FFRDC, Federally Funded Research Development Center. Can you maybe describe, again, what that is for anybody that, that, that's not aware? And then what's your favorite part of working at the SEI and an FFRDC? A little two-part question. Maybe it's you can merge into one, but what's your, what's your favorite parts? My favorite part? Yeah. Well, I, I think I mentioned this uh, sort of in the intro, yeah. which is I get to think about things here for a living. Yeah. Right? Now, that's not to say there's not so, lots of other things to do, but yeah. – uh, supply chain is a great example. Uh, I came here with a nascent interest in supply chain, and you know, twelve years later, not only are we we have a body of supply chain work, and I've presented uh, at RSA yeah. and lots of other places. Um, I also then use that interest uh, to find a role in executive education here on campus, where I I teach the supply chain risk management module for our chief information security officer and our chief risk officer programs. Right. Um, so uh, the ability to be self-actualizing, the ability to pursue these things um, was what drew me to an FFRDC and what makes me stay at an FFRDC. Now, what is an FFRDC? Well, federally Funded Research Development Center. Yeah. So um, these are congressionally established and mandated entities that are uh, sponsored by a number of, of different parts of government. In our case, we're sponsored by the Department of Defense. Right. So we're one of the Department of Defense's federally funded research center development centers. We're administratively homed here at Carnegie Mellon University. So um, you are an employee of Carnegie Mellon University, which comes with all sorts of great benefits. 
um, but you're part of this very specialized unit of the university called a federally funded research and development center. So you mentioned benefits. One of my personal benefits is continue education. Like the, the yeah. SCI continually wants us to improve and provides and puts behind it, you know, money and resources for us to do it. How, how have you used the continue education sure. uh, credits or, you know, it, to, to improve your career? Yeah, you, you, yeah, that, that is, it's, it's, that's such an important point that I think we often yeah. overlook. So you have more latitude here than anywhere in my experience to yeah. pursue and, and build your skills. Um, you know, I've used that to do, you know, formal education, meaning um, pursuing uh, degrees, pursuing certificates. Right. Um, taking training courses in specialized subjects. Uh, it's kind of all there for the taking. It is routine uh, if you join the organization that we would sponsor your CISSP um, or, or other certifications, right? Um, in, in the pen testing space, there's a number of kind of specialized certifications that we're looking for and we'll help you get there. Great. Right. Uh, to go back to more technical work here, like the SCI has a lot of work going on at Zero Trust. I know we have a Zero Trust Industry Day going on. Yeah. Where is that? Scope work fit into, into your so sure. directorate, or are you involved in the, the Zero Trust Industry Day, or mm -hmm. can you talk about that? At all? I am, yeah. yeah. So um, Zero Trust, I think there's there's kind of two two ways in which we're involved. Yeah, there's Zero Trust as a subject. So how do you establish? And I would describe Zero Trust as a set of principles. Right. It's not you can't buy like Zero Trust in a box, yeah. really, right? Right. So how do we how do we aspire to those principles? So that's kind of one stream is establishing Zero Trust. The other is how does Zero Trust modify all the things we already do? So if you think about risk management, right, Zero right. Trust requires you to make risk management decisions. Um, it changes your requirements for resilience. So all the, everything we do, insider threat, right? So if you're making fine-grained access control decisions, does it modify the way that you insider risk? Well, yes, it does, right? So there's kind of two pieces to that. Um, so I'd say Zero Trust is a hot topic for good reason. Um, and I think it's another one of those examples where as an FFRDC, we have the latitude to explore all of those things. We don't just have to produce a zero trust product per se yeah. and say this is the solution. Great. Uh, again, you know, these positions report to Matt, so we want to give people a little insight into you, so they get sure they, they hit the ground running. They're going to know a little bit about Matt, so we're going to ask you some rapid fire Let's questions to to get to know Matt a little bit. Favorite book? Favorite book is a tough one. So I was thinking about this. I think I'd, I'd offer two. So I think For Whom the Bell Tolls by okay. Hemingway might be my favorite. But I think On the Road by Jack Kerouac is probably the most impactful for me growing up. Uh, awesome. Speaking of growing up, when you knew you wanted a STEM career? Uh, okay, so that's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, we if didn't, you're in a STEM, consider, yeah, you know. Yeah, you know, yeah. We, we, um, we didn't call them STEM careers. Yes, yeah, right. Um, you know, when I, right. <laughs> right. Until recently. So um, I, I didn't know until midway through college, right? So I, I very much thought I wanted to go to law school. Right. And I was pursuing that. And then decided I really wanted to work in tech instead. So I'd say for me it was uh, maybe that's late in life by by uh, yeah. <laughs> by some standards, but it wasn't really until I was uh, junior in college. Terrific. Um, your most significant accomplishment at SEI. I know there's been been a lot. Can you narrow down what's your most significant thing that you've done here? I think the most significant thing that I've done is continue the work that was started before me and building on it. So I think you know it's the standing on the shoulders kind of analogy. So um, I go all the way back to Watts Humphrey and the founding of, yeah. of the SEI. And I had an opportunity recently to, a privilege to speak about Watts uh, at, at, a, at a conference. Yeah. And the idea that I can be part of this history, I can be part of this, this chain of brilliant people, and they let me in the door uh, yeah. to, to build on that, is, is, I think is the greatest accomplishment. So, I mean, I don't think I could point to one specific product or one specific yeah. assessment or one specific customer. I think in total, and if I, did, if I did narrow it down a little, I think we've, we've done very good. I know we've done very good work in critical infrastructure protection. I think that we move the needle on the way that our partners assess those sorts of things. Um, so I, I would highlight the work that we've done in critical infrastructure protection. But again, as part of this larger something that we do. That's a great answer, Matt. Uh, last one we're going to leave you here with, and we're, we're not going to hold you this one, but uh, what does the future of cybersecurity look like in, let's say, 2025? 2020. Not, not too far away, but yeah. still far enough out there. What changes or what, what's, yeah. what's coming? Shane, it used to, we used to think 2025 was a long time yeah. away, but it's, right. it's, it's not. <laughs> so. Okay, so you're asking what, what, what will change in the next yes. three years yeah. in cyber? In three years, my prediction is we'll see more automation. So yeah. AI and ML 
I know it sounds like the free space and bingo, but really, like yeah. it's it's changing the way we do things. It's changing the way we work and within the drive. So I think we're going to see increased automation. Um, I think we could see new guidance and regulation around privacy. I think that could be an important change for us. You mentioned zero trust. We'll undoubtedly see a shift to zero trust. Um, we will continue to think about quantum, but I think practical quantum computing is certainly beyond 2025. I'm hoping what we also see is a growth in the workforce. So one of the things I'm very proud of here is that we've we've looked beyond the obvious candidates. Yeah. So I'm hoping that in another three years, we continue to attract uh, folks that typically aren't represented in our workforce right, and bring them in the side. Another great answer. Matt, my pleasure to interview you today. Thank you for switching seats and uh, giving <laughs> up this chair well, for an episode. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It was, it was yeah. a pleasure being here and anytime. Yeah. Let's do this again. Absolutely. Once again, the SCI is hiring. So uh, we're looking for a cybersecurity assurance manager, uh, technical manager, also pen testers, some other uh, more entry level positions within the uh, CERT division. So just go to the SCI website, look for our careers tab, and you'll see a link to our job openings and work day. And if those positions are for you, we do ask that you share the archive of this, uh, spread it with your network or uh, people that may be interested. Thanks for attending, everyone. Have a great day.